Let us then continue our discussion of important major political thinkers uh, and how they pursued this question, what is politics uh, and how should we live together, what is the best life, what is the, be what is the best life together and what is the role of the <coughs> person, the individual person within uh, the society. Uh, the next stage and the next couple of thinkers will live and work within the frame framework of Christianity. Uh, this means more than what it might look that it means at first. Uh, it's not just about the appearance of some system of beliefs. Uh, our entire perspective on what the world is and what our position is within it changes. changes. And in fact we can refer more appropriately to the Judeo-Christian uh, perspective. Because it was actually in Israel, in the Jewish people, uh, that this perspective shifted, that the Christianity really spread it, of course, from one people to uh, around the world. And as you'll see, this is very much a perspective within which, whether or not you are part of Christianity, or a Christian or not, or a Jewish person or not, you s this is the system within which we actually still function, interestingly enough. Uh, <coughs> so let's, let's then look at the assumptions that are different, uh, with, uh, with Christianity. Now remember that, uh, as we discussed in, um, in the ancient world, and again, not just the Greeks, we are talking about the Egyptians, Mesopotamians, it, it, was, all, uh, it was all the same. In the, the ancient perspective was that the entire, everything there is, and of course I'm you know, drawing lines, but because I have to draw lines, but you have to imagine this is everything there is, and the gods, you know, Zeus and everything, and the human beings, and every, everything that is in the sense of every relationship in, in nature, every relationship, uh, every ethical connection, right? Uh, all those things that we uh, call meaning, right? Relationships that organize, that order the whole, and also that this disorder that is present in, in, in the whole, in the universe, Everything is part of one, which means that the gods are equally subject to uh, disorder, just like the human beings are, or the animals, or all other aspects, music, or uh, of of, uh, of everything there is. Right? So this this was the conundrum, and we saw how Plato tried to focus on the two things that really p persist, the, those relationships of order that tr truly persist, in order to base on that a theory or a, or a strategy of living the true life. And once you live the true life you can come back and you have ordered your soul rightly, you have come back and try to spread that order. The point was that if this is one, if all is one, and I, I nail upon the source of order, right, then it also means that I can change this into an ordered system. It's a possibility. Right? It is possible once, the, the challenge is to nail on the source of order, once I do that, I can come back, you know, from outside the cave and order the inside of the cave. Uh, Aristotle did, um, he looked in this, he looked more horizontally, but still, he noticed the relationships that were more permanent, relationships that gave order, right? Teleology was one of such, one such relationship, right? That everything has a nature and pursuits uh, an end according to its nature, and that's the right way. And then disorder was what was not according to the nature of the thing. So the nature of the thing was not a word, right? Words for order. <coughs> and thus, he asked what is man, what is a human being, and what is the life more accord most according to the human being, and then how society should be organized. Within this framework, right, I'm gonna, I could ask you virtually, what did they, what did they, the ancients, what did the pre-Christian, pre-Judeo-Christian, or non-Judeo-Christian perspective, what did, they, what did they think about time? Or rather, what did they think about history? Now ask yourself that. Do you think, and what do you think, but do you think that they thought that time, or history, has a direction? Because if I ask you, even, in this way, virtually, uh, I do you think history has a trajectory, has a direction? Most of us think that yes. 
Most of us assume, and you even hear politicians in the campaign chair, I think it was Hillary Clinton, talking about the, 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 the right side of history, the wrong side of history, and such. But that assumes that history has a direction. Furthermore, it assumes that history has a good direction, that it's going into, a, into the good direction. Why? Why would we assume such a thing? Why would we think that, first of all, it is linear, and then that it goes from A to a B, and B is better? Why? This is an assumption that has brought, been uh, brought about by the Judeo-Christian change in the perspective, because this is no longer the world that, that in which, which they and us picture. Let me, let me try to, to, to jump. What is the essence of the Judeo-Christian revelation, message, and so on, and, and perspective? It is the fact that it is a differentiation, a distinction between a transcendent God, one, and creation, right, which is everything. So all this that I said, it's everything, becomes two things. Two things. And maybe I can depict it like this. This thing, which is all that we know that is not God, right, has an origin, first of all, a beginning, right, when it was created, that, at a point, point zero, right, and it also has an end, because everything that has a beginning also has an end. Which means that this distance, or this trajectory, is history. This is, and it goes from A to B, because, or X to Y, whatever, right? Because it goes from God to God, in, in many, basically, right? And who is this God? What sort of a God are we talking about? This is not the gods of the Greeks, who were basically different forces, vying, competing, right? Forces with different uh, characteristics, right? This is a God, one God, the God. And this is a God that is not part of the world. It is a God that has created the world, right? It's the origin of the world, but he's not the world. Now notice the distinction, right, between this and the, uh, oh, everything is within here, and gods are imperfect and whatever. You know, if you read Greek mythology, it's pretty uh, uh, hilarious what goes on with, with the gods. Uh, <coughs> but no, not, not in this case. In this case, we see a god that is what? The origin of all being, which is also means that it's also the origin of all good, because truth is reality, is good, is right, right? Remember in Plato, right? Right is truth. Untruth is what is not right. right? So this is the God who is that, completely, and the only source of existence, the only source of being, and thus the only source of good. Because these are synonymous. These are synonymous, being and the good. Uh, in many ways, because they meet in the same origin. How do we know what's good, right? Uh, <coughs> um, how do we know that light is good, and so on? Um, well, it is a such, and it, uh, and it originates in the source of of everything which is God. The God is perfect. However, the world that he created, which was good at the beginning, and God looked at it and said it was good, right? It's a passage in the Jewish scriptures, which the Christians then will call the Old Testament. But in the Jewish scripture, in the book of Genesis, which is an account, a metaphoric account, of, 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 of which tries to develop what is the meaning of existence, that's what it says, right? What is the position of human beings within the whole? That's what it inquires into. If you ask any Jewish rabbi, he will tell you. Uh, and, um, or early Christian fathers and so on. So, what happens at the beginning? The, the word created was good, and actually the, this, there was no separation. And then you have the famous, you know, uh, again, story of, of a way in which, uh, of, um, of, uh, of the fact that the word has been broken apart from its creator. So suddenly it is disorder. Now here you suddenly see what is this, what this narrative actually tells you about why is there order that I can see, and why is there disorder that I can also see? This conundrum, that is the tension within which we live. Any, you know, this is the, the, this is the world in which we live. The tension between order and disorder, in the sense of meaning and lack of meaning, or distortion of meaning. 
but in this case, you know, because of that original sin, or you know, the the, the fact that there was an action, it, again, it's the story that tries to point out to describe the world as it is today. <coughs> so because of that uh, event, this is a broken world, a broken world that still remains good in its essence because it comes from God and goes to God. It, it's still its being is still good. In fact, all there is, all this disorder is actually just a, defor- a, a distortion, a deformity on the good. In fact, disorder or evil doesn't really exist because existing existence, being, is good, and all being comes from the only Creator, God. So, the disorder, evil, is. Everything that doesn't fit this. Just like in Aristotle, it was whatever didn't fit the teleological principle, whatever distorted the path according to each person's nature or each thing's nature, and um, and so on. Um, and this is this is that permanent thing that Plato made reference to, right? The form of the being, the form of being. Right? In many ways, of course, in, you know, it's the same pursuit, so it's not by chance that they reach similar conclusions, but. The point is that the ancients didn't have this, have this uh, perspective. Now notice that this is a completely different thing. First of all, as you see in Augustine, uh, when we talk about him, you know, we know already that this is disorder. It's granted. And this disorder is in the world, and guess where the human beings are? In the world. So the disorder is also within us. You can't escape it. It's actually in the heart, in the soul, in the self. There is no outside of it. The outside of the pain is this, in many ways. Now, back to our discussion of history, to end it uh, quickly. So, everything that is created that has an origin will also end. And it can only end in the the source of its creation, in the source that maintains it in existence. If God has created and keeps the world in existence, He's also the one who will cease keeping it in existence in the the form in which it is. And that's the end of time, so. End of times. Notice the expression. End of times of time. So, history. And from, you know, in the eschatology, both in the, meaning the, the story about the end of times, in the Jewish scriptures and also in the Christian, uh, which followed up on that, right? The end of times is good. I mean, it might, it might be tremendous, but it is a good thing because you end here. Right? However, the question within, which, within this uh, framework is what to do in between, right? Because this is where we live. This is the seculum. Right. In fact, this term seculum, S A D C U L U M, is where secular comes from. Secular word that you know. Right? Well, secular is this is, comes from theology, from Christian theology. Seculum means actually uh, <coughs> of our time, of this time, and it, Christian theology uh, used it to differentiate between this and the transcendent God, the eternal. Eternity or eternal. Transcendent, eternal, name it whatever you want. So, eternity in the sense that it's, it's not within time. It's not within history. Perfect, imperfect. Right? Imperfect in the sense that good and evil are intrinsically mixed. So, secular, secular is a good thing. It's a good term. And this is the condition within which we live. Later, of course, this will be erased in modernity by certain thinkers and developments, and we will be left with a secular, in the sense of, you know, this time, but this time as opposed to what? Right? We're not gonna, you're not going to go back ever to the ancient, everything is one, we still think that there is a beyond, but we don't know where. It's gone. Again, we're talking about, you know, historical, philosophical, you know, phenomenal developments and so on. Wherever you fall within this, that's a different uh, question. That's that's where you have to engage the philosophers, the thinkers, these developments. So <coughs> history for us has direction because we inherited this idea that it goes towards a positive end, towards an accomplishment. Now, for the Greeks, for the Greeks, this was not the case. As we, in a 
in a picture of the whole in which everything is part of the same order, rather disorder, right? Or the same disordered order, <laughs> like this, right? This is the world. Yeah. <clears throat> in such a in such a world, there is time, right? Everything is here. Gods, uh, humans, everything, order and disorder. There is no time in the sense of from A to B, X to Y, a direction. What what is Plato's, for example, view of history of time? It's circular. It's circular. It keeps going around. Because there's nowhere to go. There's no beyond. But everything happens within this reality, which is one, God's everything. So time itself is here. It keeps going around. In fact, everything in a way repeats itself. Not literally, right? But it's the same world happening the same way always. Very different. Right, from what we think about uh, history and time. Now, let, uh, let, us, let us look at um, one of the giants, really, uh, major thinkers who arose within this new differentiation, which is uh, obviously Augustine. Augustine was born about three centuries, or two and a half something, the two and a half centuries after after Christ. Actually born in 354, so yeah, three centuries. <coughs> in Africa, North Africa, he's in Africa. Um, he came from a rich family, of upper middle class, call it that way. Uh, was well educated, went to study at the uh, you know, the big school, so to speak, of the time in, um, uh, in the Italian peninsula. And his mother was Christian, his father was a Roman pagan. This is within the Roman Empire, 354 AD. Um, he uh, wasn't a Christian, he was tried out many things, he was an intellectual, he wrote, he had a good career, he had a uh, very satisfactory life by worldly standards. You know, when he was 17, he takes a mistress with which he will stay for 13 years, he will have a son with her. Then he dabbles into various calls, you know, he tries the Manichaeans and this and that. In 373, he becomes a teacher, opens a school, he's a rhetoric professor in Milan. So he has, you know, a good life, quote unquote. And this is also, however, in Milan that he hears. Uh, some sermons, some speeches from the Bishop of Milan, which is Ambrose, another towering figure, in fact. And he responds to that because clearly he was unsettled. He had he has tried life, right? And it wasn't it turned out that it's not enough. It's not enough. And he has tried to understand life, right? Every, every philosopher does to understand meaning. Right? Like Plato, like uh, Aristotle. And his pursuit of meaning led him to uh, readings of Neoplatonists, meaning followers of Plato, 600, uh, 800 years later, right? Um, the Platonic school and, and, and different sects and whatever. So he, he's studying in a way, right? He's, he's dabbling in different things. So he hears the speech by Fran Ambrose and he's, he's really, you know, it really catches, inflames his heart maybe a little bit, but he's not ready to give up the quote unquote, you know. Uh, life of satisfactions. And he leaves that mistress, takes another mistress, life will go on. However, about a few years later, he has to give in. And it was an internal struggle, and this struggle is depicted in a way in one of, the, one of his major works, and actually the first ever uh, such a piece of literature in the history of mankind, of humankind, uh, called The Confessions the first piece of autobiographical uh, inquiry into the self, into the soul, into the heart of, of the human being. Someone where, where I look inside and, and, and tell the story of my soul. Right? You, this is already a, such a well-known expression, but it never existed before, for many reasons. And not by chance, right? But, so he asks in 387 to be baptized, uh, which means uh, you know, joins in a way this uh, recognizes, uh, becomes aware, gives himself to to the Christian to Christianity, 
and uh, then goes back to Africa and uh, founds a monastery actually, becomes a monk, is ordained as priest, but remember this is a person who has lived has lived the life, right? So it's not a naive son, you know, he was a little flower growing in some corner, right? And, and he is, in the compassions you will see how torn he is by the fact that it took him so long to leave that life behind, right? Because he knows both, both the attractions and also the emptiness of that life. Um, and actually he becomes a bishop of Hippo in North Africa in 95, um, where he lives and, and teaches and writes and, and, and you know, serves the, the, the church there. Um, and he dies in 430. By this time, the Roman Empire is crumbling. Right? The Roman Empire is crumbling and he actually he dies during the siege of his own city by the barbarians, by the vandals, by the attacking hordes and so on. So he writes and lives at the, during a time of tremendous, tremendous turmoil. You know, the Roman Empire and the Roman power has been around for centuries at this time. Centuries, right? The uh, United States is young and all countries around the world basically are young in their current uh, way, the way they exist today. Well, the Roman Empire has been the order of the world, of the world, it was an empire, for centuries. And this is when it, it's falling apart and nothing is replacing it. Nothing. So it's a, it's a, it's a time of chaos and of, of fear. Because you don't know what's going to come. Right? So this is when he writes The City of God, which is another major work from, from him. But, and I'm going to post this fragment, just a short fragment from the Confessions first, to tell you, you know, his, his struggle, his recognition of what? Of Late have I loved you, O beauty ever ancient, ever new, late have I loved you. You were within me, but I was outside, and it was there that I searched you. So, and then he goes on, he tells the story of his life, right? that he searched for beauty, for the truth, for love, outside in the world, in this world, but it's not where he should have searched for it. So, the city of God, uh, this is the name of the, of the book, which is about, it's basically uh, addressed to all those who fear all these events, and to respond to accusations that somehow the um, uh, it was these new ideas of Christianity that have led to the fall of the Roman Empire. So, in the Seed of God, he, he, he deals with a thousand things, really. It's, it's, his style is uh, very organic, it grows and goes in different directions, kind of like Aristotle's lectures. And <coughs> so, he, he deals with many things. He deals with the meaning of history, he deals with destiny versus faith, he deals with uh, providence, he deals with uh, politics versus. Um, uh, faith and so on. So actually, this is where uh, anyone who deals in religion and politics, for example, will have to go to Augustine. Because he's the first one who really, really had to face it and, and deal with what the relationship between this new perspective and life in the city. So let's briefly do an overview of, of, of what, he, what he depicts here. First of all, the major, one important thing to understand for, for Augustine is that uh, one of the essential elements about how we understand the human being, or how he understood the human being, changes. You remember that in Plato, uh, the path towards the good was knowledge, right? Because the idea was, if you know what's right, there's no such thing as you won't, that you won't do what's, what's right. And every error, every uh, sin, every evil deed, was actually a result of not knowing. Because everybody acts towards the good, even a criminal acts towards the good. When a criminal commits a crime, he acts because he thinks that that, uh, that crime will do him good. So it's basically his erroneous, uh, wrong understanding of the good. It's basically wrong knowledge that leads him to act wrongly. Right? Everybody acts towards the good, only that sometimes what we think is good is not good. But this changes, and this changes because even uh, Paul, in uh, his letters, you know, part of the New Testament, the, new, the, the, the Christian scriptures, um, says, what's the drama? The drama of the Christian is that I know what is right and I don't do it. Why? Right? So Paul says this, I know, I know, I have the knowledge of what is right and what, how can I explain this thing that I still don't do it? Now, I think everybody has this experience and you know that it's 2 a.m. and you're still watching Seinfeld, you know? 
you know what is right, but you're not doing it, you should be going to, to sleep. Uh, so what is, this, what, is, what is the mystery? So Augustine explains this, um, or, or the, the framework within which Augustine explains this is by putting the emphasis on the will. On the will. The will being that <coughs> force in us, uh, that ability that we have to direct our action. Right? Knowledge is what gives us information, we know, in a way, but the will is that thing that directs our being, directs our life, that directs our uh, uh, existence. Right? So, how does this work? Right? Well, what is, so let's, let's try to depict this uh, new, um, this context within which of course, uh, Christianity, Augustine works. So, the human being in the world, right, in order to act, you know, what is the good life, what is the human being, always the same question. So, this is a human being, has different abilities, reason, knowledge, uh, will, and so on. Now, what, what directs him, uh, what is, how do you get to go in the right direction, right?